Hello and welcome to another uh, Miko Pellet hosted webinar. Uh, I'm Jamil and I'll be introducing today's event. The title of today's event is How Artists Resist Palestinian Political Cartoons. And this is a discussion featuring three very talented, very creative cartoonists who have uh, directed their art um, or at least a portion of their art at highlighting the spirit of Palestinian resistance um, in the face of uh, uh, the Israeli regime. So today we have uh, Sara uh, Kayed, uh, Mohammed uh, Sabane, and Carlos Latouf. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce them today. Um, they're going to be sharing their thoughts about the power of cartoons, uh, Palestine's history and the arts, and, and what lens they approach their work through. But um, a little bit more about our panel. Uh, Sara is a, a Bahraini UK-based artist who practiced art um, via editorial caricatures, drawings, comics, videos, uh, usable pieces, and everything in between. Um, her daily caricatures focus on refugees, corruption, power, human existence, and contradictions. In 2019, Sara won the Ibn uh, Rashid Prize for Freedom of Thought for Caricature and the uh, Mahmoud uh, Khuhail Award for Editorial Cartoons. At the moment, Sara is running a partic participatory project for, base for the Basic Income Lab. And she is also a resident, an artist in residence at Helix Arts. Besides that, she is publishing her cartoons continuously on social media as an open-ended graphic story. Uh, and then we have Carlos. Uh, Carlos is a political cartoonist and a friend of Palestinians. Um, he hails from Brazil and is speaking to us direct from there. Um, Carlos has been described by Allers and Menasat as a one-man cartoon wrecking ball when he hits the ink. <laughs> in the last few years of penning sharp cartoons, he has been alternatively praised and vilified in the press for his depictions of suffering in places like the Palestinian territories, Iraq, and the slums of Latin America. And rounding out our panel, we have uh, Mohammed. Mohammed is a uh, Palestinian graphic artist living in Ramallah, Palestine. Uh, he is the principal political cartoonist for Al Hayat Al Jadida, the Palestinian Authority's daily newspaper, and has published his work in many other newspapers around the Arab world. He is a member of the international cartoon movement, as well as the BJ movement for visual journalists around the globe. Mohammed's work has been displayed in numerous collections and fairs in Europe, the US, and the Middle East, and he won third place in the Arab Caricature Contest in 2013. Mohammed has a BA in interior design, and he currently works as an, as, and as an administrator at Arab American University's Ramallah campus. So thank you to each of you so much for your time and participation today. Um, I will be sure to provide links to your websites and social media accounts in the follow-up email for this event, as well as on mikopella.com, and I'll also be throwing this stuff in the chat. Uh, before I hand things over to Miko, uh, we are live streaming this, like I said, at the, at the top of the event. So go to Facebook, Miko's Facebook if you want to share this event with other people who didn't register. Um, we make every webinar available to rewatch along with further reading and citations at mikopella.com. We're going for about an hour discussion in this event. Um, after that wraps up, we're gonna go into an audience Q&A for 20 to 30 minutes. So at any point, if you have a question for each of any of the panelists, use the Q&A tool um, in, the, in the bottom toolbar in Zoom. And that is gonna do it for me. I'm gonna hand this over to Miko. Thanks, Jamil, and thank you to the audience, and thank you, Carlos, Muhammad, and Sarah. I can't tell you how happy I am to see you all. Um, um, Muhammad and Carlos, we've known each other for a long time. Sarah, this is uh, rather a relatively new introduction, so thanks for participating, and it's nice to see you and to meet you. I love your work. I discovered you through, through your Instagram account, the brilliant stuff that you do there. Um, and what I'll do is I'll just go around, ask you guys a few questions, and then talk about, you can answer my question or you can just talk about whatever you want uh, that you feel is important. But I think what, what, what is, what is uh, I know what I find curious, and I, I believe other people probably do too, is how does somebody, every, everybody knows you for what you do today and what you've been doing, what you're known for, but how does it start? How does somebody become a cartoonist and then a political cartoonist um, and then define such a particular style. And all three of you have, you have a particular style that defines you. You know, we don't need to see the name in order to know that it's you. Um, so how does that start? How does it develop and get to the point where you are? And Sarah, I thought maybe I'd, we'd start with you today. If you, if you could talk a little bit about how you got started and how did you develop this particular 
uh, this unique style, which makes you the, 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 the artist, the cartoonist that you are. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm so happy today. Uh, I'm so happy today to be with <clears throat> Hamad and, and Carlos. I guess uh, my relationship with social and political cartoons started very early. Um, and uh, I still remember having uh, Handala on the, on the desk uh, at school. And um, I guess the start, it was that I was amazed by uh, Najul Ali's work. It might be, you might hear this sentence a lot from many artists, but it's a true, his uh, work, uh, his works amazed me in, in many ways. Um, his ability to capture Palestine, the, uh, the beauty of Palestine, the war in Palestine, the, um, I guess, the, the complication, the betrayed in Palestine issue. He, he, captured, he captured everything. And um, locally, I was following um, Abdullah Al-Mharagi's work in Gulf newspaper. He was very well-known um, cartoonist as well. Uh, he's a painter too, and um, from that time I had the the hobby to to draw. And um, I remember a sentence for Abdul Mharagi. He said that um, when you're a cartoonist, uh, make sure you don't get swallowed uh, by a hungry whale. Uh, this art is like big sea, and um, the fun part is to be a uh, reptile. And um, I'm translating this from a magazine called Al Bahrain Taqafi that covers uh, the experiment of um, the experience of political cartoonists in in Bahrain. Uh, personally, also Palestine was the was the gate. I felt that I can practice visual commentary about daily news, um, human narratives. Uh, I found um, a local newspaper who was interested at that time to publish my work. And this is how it started. I got this frame in the newspaper and I was publishing um, uh, my work there. Um, yeah, by the time it become more than a hobby, it become, it become a way of thinking, it become a concept for me. Um, even later when I changed, I shift in my practice, political and social drawing was always there. And um, yeah, maybe I mentioned that Palestine was the gate, but also it was, it was a challenge because um, I guess my, narrati my narrativity is different than uh, someone who witnessed or loved an occupation such as Muhammad. And um, I'm, I'm drawing according to my own visual uh, memory and history about Palestine, which I think is very important uh, as well. We need every narrativity in every um, direction. Um, this, is how, this is how it all started, I think. And did you start, did you, did like you started when you were a child to draw and to, and you wanted to be a cartoonist or when did you start? When did you learn that you wanted to do this? How did it start? I, I knew that um, I was interested in drawing and I was capturing a lot of um, social and political memories. And uh, yes, I had the hobby and I was, I was a drawing since maybe I was six or seven. And um uh, yeah, and when, when I graduated from school, um, fine art was always my first um, um, my first goal. But unfortunately, in Bahrain, we don't teach. At that time, we don't, they, there is no university that teach fine art. Yeah. So uh, I studied interior design, I guess, like in Muhammad. Um, and then I continued my MA in, in fine art. And this is where... I guess it starts to be, um, the hobby start to be more than a hobby. Yeah. Mm. Fantastic, that's great. How about you, Muhammad? How did you, I mean, uh, we, we met several years ago and we've known each other and we've done things. 
Uh, I've got your book, I've got your t-shirt and stuff. How did you, but I never asked you this actually, how did you start? When did you start uh, becoming an artist and then becoming a cartoonist? First of all, I, I want to thank, thank you for organizing this, this event. And uh, I want to thank Sarah. I want to thank Carlos Latou for handling our issues, addressing issues and to draw all of these cartoons and great work about us as a Palestinian. And I don't think as drawing us as a Palestinian, drawing the humanity in Palestine, that's mean they are part from what's going on here in Palestine. Actually, I'll not start from my childhood since I was born in Kuwait and Najil Ali was working there in Kuwait and publishing his work there. And my father and my mother were always looking for Najil Ali cartoons and bring their the, the newspaper to Kuwait. My first uh, prize I got, I was six years old uh, with a, in a competition was organized by BLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization in Kuwait. But I want to start with my uh, university study because the first uh, day in the second intifada, I was a student in Najaf University. And I do remember that I missed two from two friends at that time. They were killed by the Israeli soldier. Uh, I remember my friends Zakaria and Jihad who were killed at that day. And that's uh, why I've decided I don't need to participate in any like this uh, activity in Palestine. I want to do something else. I want to do, I draw my cartoons. And that's why I did my first uh, exhibition in Al Majah University. And that was just to, uh, I, I, I just addresses all this uh, exhibition in Al Majah University for the, the students and our, my colleague who were killed uh, by the Israeli soldier during the second intifada. Then I was, I was graduated from Al Najah University, started my work with private university and started work with uh, Arab American University as a graphic designer and started publishing my cartoon with Al Hayal Jadida newspaper. But what also changed my career when I was really, when I was arrested by the Israeli soldier in 2013, because at that day, I've decided that I want to change all of my perspective and how I'm talking or depicting the Palestinian people. Because you know, Miko, I was depicting the Palestinian people as a heroes, always as a heroes, a Superman, the people who they are just fighting against the occupation. But after that, I've decided that I want to change all this perspective. I want to uh, depict the Palestinian as a human being who they living under this atrocity, under this all these hard conditions in Palestine. And that's why I published my first book in the United States of America about, about first in, in the United States of America. And then my book was published in, uh, in, in the UK, in Spain. And yeah, this is, this is the, the, the great one, the, the great. Uh, one, <laughs> the hardcover one. Yeah. Uh, but then and, and, and recently I've also got my master's degree in art and that's why I've decided I want to try something else. Now I'm, uh, I'm working on my uh, second book. Uh, it's going to be comics, not political cartoon. And I will publish my second book with a publisher in United States called Street Noise. I think next month I, I should give them my uh, all the artwork and the, the, my, my first draft for this book. Because I do believe the art is something very important for us as a Palestinian to, to, to convey our suffering under, under the occupation. Uh, I liked one of your talks, Miko, when you uh, showed the, the audience, the Palestinian airport uh, in 1947, the Palestinian cinema, to as an, as a, as a, just to, to, to make the Palestinian, they have uh, civil life, they have art before the, the, uh, the Israeli occupied their land. And that's why now I, I need to do the same thing. I want to uh, just depict our, our, our stories by my art, not just depicting the Palestinian as a heroes or as Superman or all of this kind of cartoons. Yeah. So yeah, your book is wonderful. So I look forward to the next one. And Carlos, we had a good time. It was very nice to see you in Sao Paulo a couple of years ago. Thank you for that. We had a very nice couple of uh, meetings. And uh, I think all of us have known your work for a very long time, this real revolutionary work. 
How did you start? How did you, how did you begin? You know, Miko, I feel myself like in a tea shop, um, having friends, drinking coffee and talking. So I'm very grateful for uh, your invitation, being here with you, Sarah and, and Mohammed. And inshallah, we may meet in the real world uh, someday, soon. <laughs> well, um, different from Sarah and Mohammed, I didn't have any direct relation with Palestine. My grandfather was Lebanese, but uh, uh, when I was a kid, he was dead already. So I didn't, I didn't know him. And uh, my parents barely could point Lebanon on the map, in the map. My, my grandfather was uh, Lebanese, but he didn't transmit anything about history or traditions or anything. Not even about Palestine. I never heard about Palestine during my childhood and when I was a teenager. So my, my main uh, uh, inspiration was the Mad Magazine, the Hanna-Barbera cartoons, and DC and Marvel comics. <laughs> Completely colonized by the US mainstream culture. So my introduction to uh, political cartooning was a kind of an accident because I used to draw since I was a, a kid, a child, and when I grow up, I imagine I could work for magazines, for comics magazines, or even for newspapers illustrating. But of course, you need someone to introduce you. And my family was uh, very humble. We didn't know, uh, we didn't have any influential friends or I didn't know how to start it to, uh, with, uh, uh, introducing my work for newspapers, etc. It, it, it wasn't easy like now with internet. So I, I knocked the door of many places, newspapers and etc. And usually they say, they used to say, okay, Latouf, we have, uh, we got your telephone number. We're going to call you never happened. The only opportunity I had for showing my cartoons was working for leftist workers' unions, newspapers, bulletins. Uh, they were very open-minded and I didn't have the, the need to have someone to introduce me to, to anyone. You know, I did it myself. I introduced my work myself to them and they were very uh they were welcoming welcoming me um and i started to work with this uh leftist workers unions newspapers and then i started to have contact with political topics and then i heard about palestine and in that time it was in the beginning of the 90s. Uh, we already had internet, um, dialed internet, of course. And um, I, I was amazed by the possibility of making a cartoon and uploading to a website and people in other parts of the world uh, being able to watch. And in that time, we had the fax machine. It's something nobody knows now, but I remember pretty well. I miss the times of fax machines. And before internet, I used to send cartoons via fax machines. And in, in some moments, 
I, I, I read about Palestine and I made a cartoon about the hunting season in Palestine with a Jewish settler shooting the back of a running uh, Palestinian. Mm. And this cartoon I sent to a Palestinian NGO and Hamala by fax. And they say, Latouf, if you, we, we don't have budget to bring you uh, to Palestine, but if you are able, if you manage to come to Palestine, we're going to make a tour around the territories in order to show you our reality. And I save some money and I pay my own tickets to Tel Aviv and I arrived in Ben Gurion airport and then to uh, Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And I contacted this NGO and they took me to Hamala, Hebron, uh, Nablus, Bethlehem, etc. It was 1998. In that time, the situation was not that serious like now. We didn't have the wall. We didn't have the separation between Gaza and West Bank. But even though the apartheid situation was very clear, the restrictions of movement, uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I talked to many, many people. I, I, I tried to hear many opinions. I interview uh, taxi drivers, uh, ordinary people in the streets, uh, soldiers, settlers, Palestinian activists, Israeli activists, students. So I spent in total 15 days uh, in Palestine. And back to Brazil, I decided the best way to promote the Palestinian struggle and to, denunci to, to, to expose, to denunciate the Israeli uh, apartheid was making cartoons. So that's why um, I started to make cartoons and publish on, very, uh, on many uh, websites. And that time we, we had something called Indie Media, Independent Media Center. And I published many, many cartoons about Palestine there. And then my cartoons started to be uh, seen by a large audience worldwide. So now, uh, after, you know, years uh, making cartoons about Palestine, uh, I, I keep making cartoons about Palestine. I work for two um, news uh, outlets. Uh, Mondo Vice and Mint Press News, and of course, uh, keep uh, supporting uh, campaigns, making cartoons, etc. And, um, and not only about Palestine, because yeah. I'm I'm a political cartoonist, so I, I make cartoons about the Arab Spring, the situation in Brazil, uh, in Turkey, etc. Right. Right. Wow. And Sarah, let me go back to you. I want to talk to you about something that I noticed. Um, I think I started seeing your, your, or really paying attention to your work when you started posting stuff about the normalization and then the campaign against the normalization and you used the word in Arabic, la. Mm -hmm. And you made this incredible, you used the uh, braids, the women's braids. And after a while, I only noticed that it's la, and then the scissors, and then the birds, and you created this incredible, I don't know, a combination, I suppose, of ways to say la. Mm -hmm. I think one was, there was the, the, the first plane, I think, was, was flying to Tel Aviv, and all the birds' beaks were saying, um, can you talk a little bit about that, about the, maybe about the campaign, but but, but 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 your contribution uh, in developing that 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 uh, that idea. Yeah. So I, I even tried to buy a t-shirt. You made a t-shirt too. I tried to buy, I even tried to buy it, but they ran out. I think. Yeah, I haven't I haven't received mine yet. So, um, so um, I'm so glad that you you found them interesting and 
for me, the idea of resistance in political cartoons, it's kind of collaborative work with the viewers. So you make one version of cartoons and then the viewers surprised you with this hundred of versions. Every time they put different title, uh, they wear it as a t-shirt. Uh, they put it in a certain video, they discuss it <clears throat> differently. They give you new versions of from, from the work. And when, the, when they announce the uh, normalization, by the way, I, I was disappointed just like many people, but I guess it wasn't that surprising. We kind of knew that through years, the support is coming from, it has always been coming from the people themselves. Um, so I, I was thinking of something that can be, um, I didn't decide if it's gonna be one piece or it's gonna be serious of work or it's gonna be wearable or, I think this part, is, the best about this part is that it's always surprise. Um, my first work with uh, La or, or No was um, a two part of uh, political, uh, it's the same piece, but it has two parts. Um, and I was uh, trying to bring the, the school uh, rebellious spirit because most of my own uh, visual memory about Palestine is coming from the school. I remember every morning when we used to wake up and sing the national song in the school and then Palestine would be uh, there as, as part of our um, morning program before we go back to the classrooms. And the political cartoon is like two pieces. The first piece is um, uh, the people sitting uh, uh, as kind of students and listening to the authority who's trying to, uh, to uh, feed them in some way with yes and um, the surface of the surface of the table um, is is very tempting a place uh, for for us as a students always to sketch on it although it was somehow forbidden so there is no uh, in front of uh, in front of each person and then the second part people are raising uh, these table, uh, surfaces in the face of the in the face of authority. That was the first one. I felt we needed um, some way to tell the people that to say no is still uh, possible. And uh, the second one was the one with the braid and the the two women. I guess I felt it's very necessary to put um, the image of the women there the culture, the outfit, the hair. In Middle East, hair is a symbol for, for many things. Uh, keeping your hair long has certain meanings. Cutting your hair has certain meanings too. It's a meaning of, um, I guess we somehow in some way related to honor as well. And they're linked. So um, they have one, one kind of, um, uh, one ha uh, two heads, but one uh, long hair. They also, um, they also have, like the Palestinian woman has the Palestinian thobe, the Bahraini woman has a different one, and then you added the Sudani one later on after the agreement was Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I was just going to comment about the, the outfit. The outfit in both cultures, the Palestinian and the Bahraini, is very vibrant and bold. Even the Sudanese one. I went to Sudan, and one of the things that... Uh, 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 that I was so attracted to was how women wrap all of these folds with the with the outfit. That's why I later added to the uh, to to the visuals. And then oh, I have this. Uh, this is the just the Sudanese part later that I link it with the. I, know. I don't know where's the first one gone, but anyway. Um, so then the the um, the Bahraini initiative for uh, against uh, normalizing contact me and said, well, we think um, maybe there's an opportunity to um, print them on t-shirts and then um, people people can 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 wear them. Um, and it was great because when you print um, 
an illustration, a T-shirt. It, it has it has additional meanings too because it's it's so powerful. People are like wearing those protesting banners and they walking everywhere with it, and everyone is looking at at this message. Um, and then you have this kind of a new movement for this illustration because it starts to move. It's not a still image anymore, which give it kind of extra power, if, if that makes sense. So, um, and, and later it's, it starts to be, it was very effective for people. It was easy. Um, and it was the exact opposite for, for yes. It's a straightforward. Uh, to say no to um, the recent uh, rush to normalize the relationships with Israel. Yeah. And Muhammad, I'm looking at your book actually. And in, initially when I started looking at your work, um, I thought you saw me, I think, you know, I think I started sharing your work on, on, on Facebook. The two things that struck me, one is the, there's a boy that always shows up. Sometimes it's just one boy, but sometimes it's children, but there's just one boy and he has a very particular face that you give him. And then there's the Israeli soldier that you draw. He's very big, he's very heavy. It almost looks like he's made of concrete. He's got this big head, this big face, and it's, very, and it's unique. That is the face of the Israeli soldier. Everywhere you, you see him in your work, and then there's a, a lot of times, and many of them, there's this boy in that, whether it's a big work or it's a small one, but these two are very distinctly your, your style. Can you talk about those two? Actually, I, I'm gonna talk about, yeah, I, I will talk about that. Uh, like Sarah mentioned that most of the cartoonists, especially the Palestinian and the Arab cartoonists, were influenced by Najil Ali. And always we remember that Najil Ali and Hamdala's main character that he, he used to use in his cartoon. In, in, in one way that's, you need to, to continue that, that style that still we think about these kids. And on the other hand, always we are thinking about the next generation. Now, uh, living in the, under this occupation more than 20 years now, since 1997, when I traveled from Jordan to, uh, to Palestine. But always I think about the next generation, our kids, how they will live under this uh, atrocity, under this, under this apartheid uh, style. And you will see these kids in my next uh, book, actually, also. Uh, my first book, uh, uh, I use a lot of kids. In my second book, also, I will talk about a lot of kids because I try to, to make this, this transfer from the, the meaning of the occupation to the meaning of the uh, settler colonialism. Now, as a Palestinian, we should use or we should talk about the, the uh, settler colonialism and try to, to like, dismantle this this situation, the, the main tool for the settler colonialism, that they want to dehumanize the, the natives, the Palestinian people, and they want to convey that the Palestinian people, they are not a human being, they are people, barbaric people, the tribes, they were here without culture, without uh, uh, ideology, without religion, without, without any thoughts, without heritage, and that's why I, I changed all of my work just to, to focus on this point. I want to rehumanize the Palestinian people and to talk about them as a human being. And that's the main tool that I want to use again, the settler colonialism now by my art and by my cartoon or by my comics. I think it's very important to, to make this uh, contrast be between the small kids and the Israeli soldier. Ahadid Tamimi and the Israeli soldier. The, the kids in, 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 in the Israeli prison and the, the, the jailer. I've met a lot of kids in the Israeli prison and why I was surprised how, how, they, how they live in this uh, atrocity under this, in this situation. That's, I'm a big guy, I'm, I'm a big man. And even while I'm a big man, I, I, I could not live as, as a human being in, in this condition. And I was surprised at how, how these kids used to manage their time in this Israeli, in Israeli prison. Uh, I think all the Palestinian people, even 
in the Israeli prison or outside the Israeli prison, and even the Palestinian people outside Palestine, all of these people, they are in the prison. They, we cannot live out of this idea that we are surrounded by the world, surrounded by the checkpoints, Israeli settlements, and all of the situation. And that's why always I want to put this in front of all of the people around the world to ask them what exactly, how exactly you will support all of these kids who they live, uh, who, who they live uh, under this atrocity, Israeli atrocity. And that's why I, I use the kids. That's why I want to provoke the people to, to support the Palestinian people as a human being, not just as a fighter, not just as a, uh, the not just because of their political uh, rights, because of their human rights, they want to, to live uh, like a human beings. Yeah. And Carlos, your style, of course, you, you created this uh, Mama Palestine that is very distinct. You see her. Um, so if you could talk about that, but also uh, a friend of mine here, Jack Thomas, just reminded me something. There was a cartoon that you made of Netanyahu firing missiles at Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> and a couple of years ago at the uh, labor conference in Liverpool, somebody held it outside and they kicked them out. The police came and kicked them out. And it was a big scandal because they said it was anti-Semitic, which of course is it, only the Zionists can come up with something uh, so absurd. But uh, talk a little bit about your style, about Mama Palestine, about this very particular style that you've developed in, in your political cartoons. It's very direct, it's very, very clear. Um, Miko, about that cartoon of Jeremy Corbyn, the worst part of the story is not to have the banner removed by, by police, but you have Jeremy Corbyn supporting the action of police and calling that cartoon I made originally for Mondo Vice in support of Jeremy Corbyn against that fabrication of anti-Semitism allegations. He called that cartoon as anti-Semitic poison. And exactly, what is exactly anti-Semitic in that cartoon? It was... Uh, Netanyahu, who, who is the, the head of the state of Israel, the state of Israel, the political body called Israel, firing a missile against uh, Jeremy Corbyn and a pulpit uh, speaking about Palestine. That's all. So what exactly this is anti-Semitic? And why Jeremy Corbyn labeled this cartoon I made in support of him as anti-Semitic poison, because Jeremy Corbyn, in fact, is a coward. He decided to, uh, to please the Israeli lobby in order to, you know, uh, save his ass for, for allegation of anti-Semitism. In a matter of fact, even he apologizing all the time, giving explainings all the time, the Israeli lobby crushed, crushed him, you know. And Jeremy Corbyn is not able to identify his allies, identify people who are fighting the Israeli apartheid. So Jeremy Corbyn, in my humble opinion, is a shame for the Palestinian struggle, in my humble opinion. About um, the martyr Palestine, when I was in Jordan, in 2009, um, I, I, made, uh, I made a visit, I, I, I visited many uh, uh, Palestinian refugee camps. One of them, if I remember well, is Mark Schnaller or something, Mark Schnaller. Mohammed probably can correct me about the, the, the Arabic name. Mark Schnalla, something like this. It's a, it's a huge refugee camp in, in, in Jordan. And there, in, in there, I had the opportunity to meet uh, an old woman, uh, Z Z uh, Zafira, Zahira, I, I cannot remember. I, I'm an old, old guy. Um, and 
she was a, a, a Palestinian woman, elderly, and she was expelled from Palestinian territories more or less three times in three different moments. So it was amazing to see how even having that long history of uh, long record of suffering, she was very strong and active. And I remember she had a cane and when she, she, she was uh, speaking, he branded that, that cane. And when I saw that woman, I imagined that woman as a representation of Palestine and the Palestinian struggle, Palestinian resistance, the resistance of the, the ordinary Palestinian. Because when we talk about Palestinian resist, resistance, uh, especially the Western mainstream media is always showing us images of people with Kalashnikovs. And the resistance can be done in many different ways, in making poems, making writings, movies, music, cartoons. So um, I was inspired by that woman, Zaf Zahira, Zafira, I cannot remember very well. Um, inspired by her to make that uh, character Mother Palestine. So she's a real person. That's fascinating. I, yes. Just his Schlinner uh, refugees camp, right? Schlinner? Yeah, 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 exactly. And, Schlinner. and that's, that's woman, yeah. And that's woman, the grandmother of Muhammad Abu Afif, uh, uh, cartoonist. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know yeah. her. I know her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's another Palestinian cartoonist, and he told me that uh, he you used uh, his his grandma as a, as a main character for the Palestinian refugees. <laughs> and you had the opportunity to meet her? No, actually, but Muhammad Bafifi he's one of my friends. He's he's a great Palestinian cartoonist. Also, he lives in in Jordan. Yeah. Yeah, he he's a great guy. And yeah. I, I still remember the way she used to talk, branding that cane, you know. She's, she was very strong, you know, very strong. So uh, impossible not to. And I remember Sarah telling, telling about the, the presence of the women in cartoons. And I could not imagine another person to represent the Palestinian struggle that, than that woman, you know, because she suffered a lot. He was expelled three times, three times. And she, she uh, spent the rest of his, her life in a refugee camp in Jordan. And, and believe me, you, you probably know, you have worse places in Lebanon for Palestinians than in, in Jordan, for example. But she was a real representation of resistance. She was strong, she loved, she, she was amazing. So that's why when I saw that woman talking and bring that cane, I, I thought to myself, she's the mother of Palestine. <laughs> that's fantastic. And Muhammad, what's, what's, the, what's the, the name of the cartoonist or grandson? Uh, his name is Muhammad Abu Afifi. He used to work with Al Ghad in Jordan. Then he worked with, I think, with Cartoon Movement. He's a photographer. He, yeah, he, he was a photographer, but now he is doing some graphic novel. I think Sarah, she, she knows him also. He's a mm. great, great artist, I think. But he, He's he, wonderful. He, He's one of the yeah. best, yeah. yeah. He doesn't work you now with any newspaper, but he's a great cartoonist, I think. And he's crazy. That's, that's a good thing. But he's a crazy guy. <laughs> I think yeah. maybe the best way to follow him is, is his Facebook. He published there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And he has a video series on YouTube now, which is very interesting. That is yeah. an incredible story. I don't, that is, that, that's an incredible story. I was, <laughs> I was expecting <laughs> that. So. Let's ask you guys one more thing, you know, uh, about your work as artists. And uh, Sarah, a lot of your, I mean, what I see on your Instagram, the art is in the movement, you know, in, in is, it's on the device. 
So you see the first image, then you slide, you see the second image and it develops, it develops, it develops. And that's a, it's very much alive on the device. Um, but is there a way to express that? I mean, do you also have that as actual art? And my question to all of you is going to be, is there an actual art piece or is everything alive, comes to life and, and, and movement only virtually, only on our modern devices? So how does that work, Sarah? Do you, like sometimes you have blood spilling and you see it spilling and developing and developing and developing as you move from screen to screen. Mm. But is there like uh, an actual, are these actual pieces? I mean, is, can that be expressed as actual pieces as well or only virtually like this? Uh, it, it depends. I guess each visual is different. Um, this is one of the things that you can inspire from. Um, from social media platforms and how they arrange these visuals. Because you can get this option from an Instagram, for example, that you go through like, I think 10 visuals or nine visuals, but you don't have the same thing on Twitter. So the arrangement of the work is, is different on, uh, on Twitter. And then it's, and then again, it's different on, on Facebook. Um, Sometimes I rearrange them and, and sometimes it depends, each work is different and it all depends on the idea itself. Um, I don't see the, the social media as, you know, like they have been for political cartoonists. It can come with its disadvantages because it will not publish or promote your work according to the content itself, but, you know, according to the likes and comments and blah, blah, blah. So um, once another person come with different idea, he will be a priority when it comes to showing the visual or the, or the news. But it can be an opportunity. In 2019, I published a work about, um, about Palestine. It has this um, Israeli flag that turns, uh, it was a video actually, and it turns it from uh, Israeli flag to Nazi flag or Nazi logo. Uh, and it was banned from the, the Instagram. Although it doesn't, it doesn't have anything violence. Uh, it just, it's just my own opinion, you know, and it was deleted. Um, but to be honest, that was, that was once in, in many years. Uh, when I used to work in printed, uh, printed magazines or newspapers. Um, there was limits when it comes to showing the work. So we have like uh, certain sizes in a certain frame and you kind of directly think of the visual in this, in this way. And sometimes it's not the best for the idea, but, but it's the best for the, the sizes that the editors give you. So I guess there is a certain kind of life for political cartoons on printed media. And there is, again, another life for them on social media. One of the things that you get in social media as well is the fake people commenting and making noises. Constantly. And you don't even know if they are real or not. Um, uh, yeah. But do these pieces also have a life, like as something you display in a gallery or, in, or in, a, in an exhibition? Because when you do it online, when you look at your phone and you scroll from screen to screen, mm -hmm. something there's there's a you know there's a suspense there. You don't know what's where it's going to lead. Yeah, um, you, yeah. The, these kind of works sometimes it's best to stay on on social media because. They, they were made with the, you know, the dynamic of the movement of the visuals on that platform. But sometimes uh, the, the idea is the best to be shown in an exhibition. You need to come closer to the, to the picture to see the details. Um, yeah, it, it, it all works differently. Do you show these things on, on display like at a, at a gallery or an exhibition live as actual pieces too? Um, pieces? Sometime, yeah, I do. Uh, I had a couple of, of exhibitions and I was supposed to um, exhibit uh, Trump t-shirts. 
in uh, in Baltic 39, but because of COVID restrictions, um, the gallery is uh, closed now. So it's a uh, state where Trump is in the armpit or something. Yeah, yeah, he's in the armpit <laughs> talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Muhammad, you have like. You have a lot. I mean, you've done a book. You have these big, big, big pieces like Guernica's that you've done. Are they actual? Because I've seen them. I've seen you show them on on social media. Can I share? Can I share my screen? Yeah. I I want to show my the, the audience just exactly what what I do now because most of the people they know my work through the 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 social media, but no one exactly know what I've done recently. Can you see that the big flag, this one? Oh my God, yeah, yeah, I know that. Yeah. This one, this is my last artwork and this is very big because uh, I've done that as a printmaking and another artwork here just to see the size of that. Um, Where do you yeah. display that? Still, I, I didn't display it any, any place because, uh, you know, I need a gallery and I'm not good with the gallerists here in Palestine since uh, the gallerists need, uh, need a will, I, don't, I can't say it, will known artist, but they need someone who's making something very commercial for, unfortunately, the art in, in Palestine because most of the gallery need that. But I want to share another one just to show you exactly what I do. This is the size of that flag, the printmaking one. Uh, I've done that when I traveled back from, from the UK. And you know, uh, Miko, you've been here for a long time. We don't have any facility for printmaking or do art here in Palestine. I've done that uh, manually without any facilities, without any machines, uh, just to carve the Palestinian uh, flag as an artwork. And now I'm, I'm working not just, uh, I want to share another thing, another video for my uh, last project. Where is it? Yeah, this one. Uh, this one is, you can see the, the carving for my printmaking. Oh, wow. This is my new book who was invented in the uh, United States with street noise. Uh, what exactly I want to do is not just to follow the social media because I do believe as an, the people who they produce intellectual work, maybe writing, drawing, doing cartoons or printmaking, uh, should do the production. Because uh, I do believe that there are, there are many books, uh, films, uh, things that talk about the, the Holocaust, the Israeli narrative, to convey the Israeli narrative and to, to, to block the Palestinian narrative. And that's why exactly I need to do Palestinian production as a book, as a, an exhibition, as an artwork, not just a visual, not just by virtual uh, uh, life with social media and website. And also you can go to an exhibition to see real artwork by Palestinian artists who they are challenging, not just the occupation, challenging, challenging their condition in Palestine to produce this artwork. The process here in Palestine, you are not just protest, protesting or resistance, uh, resist against the occupation. You resist against your condition under this occupation. The lack of resources, the lack of facilities and all of these things condition were produced by the occupation. And that's why if you just produce art, you are proving as a Palestinian that you are a human being and you are resist by you, your humanity against this atrocity. And that's why I think it's very important to do that as an, as an artist, not just as a cartoonist, as an artist, to, be, to produce this kind of art. And also to sell this art for the people around the world, because I think we, we should do that. We should do production to give the people alternative thing, not just to live by the, the uh, colonialism culture. Uh, that's why I'm doing uh, comics uh, or graphic novel for, for my second book, because I think as a Palestinian, we, we capable to do that. We, 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 we should resist, we should fight against all of this condition to 
convey our narrative. And that's why I think it's, it's very important to do that. And uh, that's what I do now. Wow, that's very interesting. I will stop sharing to give the mic for my friends, Carlos. Wow. Carlos, how about you? Do you do actual pieces that are displayed somewhere or is all your stuff all your stuff just displayed online? I mean, I know you gave me that beautiful thing you made for me, but you uh, do you actually have pieces or how do you work? Uh, no, usually not. Usually uh, these cartoons uh, are more editorial, so different from uh, what Mohammed shown us um, piece of art for sure it, it can be okay let me show you an original yeah. this is a, a, a ordinary paper can be displayed in a in a museum or in a gallery but for example this this pieces of art made by mohammed are more suitable for an exhibition ex exhibition than this you know this is more editorial i think uh, yeah. But I, I already had uh, some uh, cartoons printed in canvas and plastic canvas and displayed in exhibition uh, last uh, in 2019 uh, about the situation in Brazil, the the threat to democracy. We we made we and other cartoonists cartoonists here and here Grande do Sul uh, arrange an exhibition of cartoons. But usually. These cartoons are more editorial, more, you know, seen online. So you don't have so much of actual pieces that you that you display. No, no, no. But as I said, uh, since these uh, artworks are uh, uh, digitalized, uh, they can be printed in in big canvas, plastic right. canvas. And displayed in a, in a, in, a, in, a, in an exhibition like that uh, banner you mentioned uh, about Jeremy Corbyn, for example. Your work is you see your work uh, in protests all over the world. So obviously people saw it and printed it. I don't know if they talked to you first or not, but your stuff is shows up in protests everywhere all the time. The, the yeah, different, yeah. Different things you've you've done. Um, I'm curious to ask you something. It has nothing to do with cartoons, but when we met. In, in Sao Paulo, this was just before Bolsonaro came to office. And you were very worried. You, it seemed like uh, there was a storm coming and there's nothing anybody can do. It's going to be catastrophic. And it's been a couple of years. How, how, how are things? How is it? <laughs> it's a catastrophe. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, I, think, I was I right. Know, I don't think people know much about Brazil and, and Bolsonaro and what this means. Uh, who cares about Brazil anyway? Huh? <laughs> who cares about Brazil anyway? We, we are a, a, a hellhole. And now, and now it's, it's more clear we are just a, a colony. You know, you, we are just a banana republic because Bolsonaro is, is uh, the worst politician uh, available in Brazil. He's, he's a, a true fascist and friend of Netanyahu. This is something very important you mentioned. <laughs> Bolsonaro has as a political base uh, the far right, Nazis, far right, and the, the, the evangelical Zionists, the cr Christian Zionists, and the Jewish Zionists, the far right in Israel. So uh, it's very interesting to see those guys, those, those Bolsonaro supporters, taking the streets with flags of United States and Israel. <laughs> but the, 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 the big problem, um, Miko, is um, I, 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 uh, I, I was talking to Sarah and Mohammed. Uh, we in Brazil, we had two, two traps, the coronavirus and the Bolsonavirus. <laughs> we have a president who constantly denied uh, 
uh, the, the very seriousness of uh, the pandemic. He mocked the, the, the people uh, who died. He said, oh, we, we in Brazil, we reach an official numbers, 200,000 dead by COVID-19. And Bolsonaro say things like, oh, say la vie, um, that's the way life goes. You know, we need to keep going. You know, uh, this is just a, a little flu. The, 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 Bolsonaro is not only a negationist, but also he's working against the vaccine. He said once he won't buy, wouldn't buy the Chinese vaccine. He, uh, he already, uh, the ministers, the government already referred uh, to the coronavirus as the, the Chinese virus. It's a more or less like a caricature, a, a, a badly drawn caricature of Trump, you know. So yeah. we are facing a deadly virus and a president who is saboting uh, the, 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 the measures against the virus. He's working on behalf of the virus. So that's why I, I say uh, we, we are suffering from two diseases, the coronavirus and Bolsonaro, unfortunately. Uh, you, you, I, you, I, 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 I'm sure we're going to read of coronavirus, do the vaccine, but Bolsonaro is a more problematic. It's more problematic. Now, you've, I've seen your you know, cartoons you know, criticizing Bolsonaro, lots of them. Do you where, where do you where do you display them in in in, uh, in uh, Brazil? Do newspapers uh, uh, show your cartoons, or where where do they show? Uh, media outlets and social medias in Brazil. In Brazil, yes, because uh, uh, Bolsonaro is also the enemy of the the press, you know. So these cartoons are more popular now because you know. Even the mainstream media uh, uh, dislike Bolsonaro. Maybe in the past, those cartoons won't be so popular, but now uh, even the mainstream media, uh, the journalists of the, the mainstream media uh, dislike Bolsonaro because the guy is completely, completely stupid, you know, and fascist. It's, it's, it's very important to say he's a fascist. He's not a conservative or right-wing. Fascist. Yeah, I remember you said that when we met. And when is the next election? When does he? Go, when can people vote him away? Vote him out? Uh, Twenty twenty-two. And the perspective we have perspective of re-electing Bolsonaro. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's, it's completely crazy, but he still have a good rate of approval, popular approval, according to polls. <laughs> it's completely crazy because the guy is destroying the country. Yeah. The guy is collaborating for the death of people, even though people think Bolsonaro is doing right. But you're saying that now it's easier for you to actually show your cartoons in media in Brazil because of this. So what? Excuse me? You're saying that more of your cartoons are being shown in Brazil now because of Bolsonaro. Exactly, exactly, exactly. About about political, uh, local political topics, yeah, local you know. Politics, yes. Because so it's, 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 it's impossible for anyone uh, who have who has a brain to support Bolsonaro. Even you, you can be even a right winger, but support Bolsonaro is is completely you know the the guy is a, as I say it's a caricature. Of Trump is yet more stupid, yet, yet more cretin. The, the, the guy is a bad caricature itself, himself. Yeah, yeah. I think we can see that even from the outside. I want to ask all of you now because that's interesting. That was kind of leading to my next question about the the intersection of politics and art. Does uh, your work have influence? Does do you care if it has influence, or is it just something you do to express? your opinions and your thoughts. What do you think, Sarah? 
Sorry, can you repeat the question, Miko? Yeah, I said the, the where the intersection where art and politics meet. Does your art, does your political, do, your, do you expect your political cartoons to make a difference, to have an influence, or is it just just a vehicle for you to express a particular opinion? Mm, I guess both. Um, everything can be related to to uh, politics, even if you draw. I don't know, a mug or a flower, if you think of how it was made and who made it and their payment and everything, it, it can be, it can, it can take a political kind of direction. Mm -hmm. I hope both, I want to express what um, my own opinions uh, about everything. Um, and I think it's, it's naturally, it's coming that the, once you publish, uh, the people get, uh, get affected. I can talk a lot about how how the idea of of, uh, of cartoons are um, get its get its power from, or how these uh, how this medium is is so is so powerful, and it's coming from different angles. Um, first of all, is is the medium itself? We're talking about a picture, which is already a powerful medium, and um, and politicians realize this fact very well. Uh, that's why, for example, Najil Ali was threatened to get his uh, his fingers dipped in acid before even he was murdered. Or, <clears throat> you know, many Arab regimes who are using Palestine as, as a hangar, or even the I Iranian regime, uh, who's putting cartoons in prison and torturing them. Um, and I think it's also about what's inside these pictures, the power of cartoons coming, how these topics are being discussed, the sense of a humor, um, I, I would say the, the easiness and um, the readability in, in, these, in these pictures. It's very readable and easy for a different level of interest or different ages or cultures. Um, Although I might use maybe certain metaphors from the Bahraini culture, the Palestinian culture, or any other culture, but um, any person from uh, from anywhere can get something from these drawings. It doesn't have to be Palestinian or because we're talking about the language of the of the graphics or the drawing itself. Um, and of course, we have the the sense of a humor. I wouldn't say that my work is funny. <laughs> I'm very bad at giving uh, jokes. Um, when I see my work, I say, wow, that, that's very, it is kind of encouraging. And this is what I'm hoping people to see. But it's not, it's not that funny as, for example, when I see Carlos or some of uh, Muhammad's work. I'm saying some because Muhammad's work is also I guess he's following um, like some sort of black humor. Hamad, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I hope that through this medium I can um, express my own opinion, uh, but also give uh, like an open um, space for people to react, to think, uh, to, to comment. And by the way, I'm very open that if anyone is feeling that he wants to take any illustration and steal it and hack it and make anything with it. Um, I never had any problem with that because I don't think that even, this is the question of which one is original and which was not, I don't think that there is any work is original. It was made for people to um, react in a certain way uh, with it. And who's the, who do you expect your audience would be when you create, like, for example, with uh, the campaign, the no campaign, the lack campaign, mm -hmm. you have in mind who the audience is? Who's the audience? I mean, you put it out there and then what? What do you expect? Um, I think I have a lot of um, Arabs because I publish many cartoons about the Middle Eastern issues. And there's a lot text in Arabic, which of course will... I was, to, I was going to mention that. A lot of the, 
the actual art is Arabic writing mm -hmm. within the cartoon. So you don't have the, the writing and then the cartoon, but the writing is no, in, damn. and you have to find it. That's another thing that you do that's, that's, that's unique. Yeah, the, the idea is, is in the calligraphy itself, yeah. is in the wave of these letters and everything. Um, I like to work in this area between writing and, and drawing, so. And, and was the La campaign, did it work? Did it, is it still going on? It was against the normalization. Did it have any impact? I hope so. I saw a lot of uh, good reaction from the people on, on social media. Um, the t-shirts were sold out and they start printing, um, uh, printing more. So, um, yeah, so I hope this is, uh, this is a very good direction. Of course, I'm still receiving, um, messages, weird messages, just the same charges that this is, um, anti-Semitic or there is a new propaganda that, um, Maybe because obviously I'm Muslim, but they are trying to promote the idea that this is against um, what Islam would say, or Prophet Muhammad had a very good relationships with the Jews. So this is this is unfair. Of course, this is all um, misdirecting the original uh, issue that we are calling for. It has nothing to do with Jewish or anything. Um, but yeah, again, this is the this is the issue of social media. Even with when I'm receiving these messages, you don't know if these uh, people are real or they are just a bunch of of, of 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 lies. We use this term recently a lot at the bubble electronic, which means all of these armies unknown. You don't know if they're real or not. Um, just to push um to push their opinion yeah they usually have no followers and they pay they're paid to do this yeah yeah fascinating muhammad you work in palestine who is your audience and by the way you were arrested by the israelis and you also had trouble with the palestinian authority for your work the, Isra the israeli intelligence my, my my audience actually the israeli government and the pro-israeli people because always they are attacking me <laughs> they are my my main my main audience actually and the palestinian authority the security here in palestine that's it <laughs> i have a lot of audience actually you asked why we have choose to talk about the politics and even if, if we want to make change or we are just doing art because we, we need to do art. That's that's question one of the Israeli uh, officers, uh, one of the Israeli officers in the uh, Olympi Bridge or King Hussein Bridge uh, last year asked me this question. Why you are, why you are keep drawing the Israeli soldier? Draw something else. And I was surrounded by the Israeli soldier and that's why I told him, because I'm surrounded by you, I'm drawing you. I don't, I've never seen anything else in this country to draw. Even if you want to draw landscape in Palestine, you will draw Israeli settlement or the Israeli checkpoint or Israeli wall. And that's why, why, why I'm, I'm doing this kind of art. And to be, audience, to, be, uh, to be honest with all the people, actually I've decided when I travel to, to United Kingdom that I will stop drawing about Palestine. I will take this one year rest. I will not do anything about Palestine. I will I will look for something else to refresh my mind to to, to try to some to find something else, and I I want just want to to share this this um, this photo for uh, British artist. His name is George Ham, and he was hired by the Israeli government in 1970 to draw some or to do some visual narrative for the Israeli country, and he did this illustration in 1970. And because I was student with UCA, the University of the, the Creative Art, uh, and we, we, we moved to this exhibition to see his, his art and to criticize his art. And when I when I've seen this, this poster or this illustration, I told my, my, my teacher, this is not an art, this is uh, propaganda. When uh, a British artist in 1970, that's mean just three, three years after they occupied Jerusalem, he draw this illustration about uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem that they bring all of the modernity cars and 
cities, the big cities, factories to Jerusalem, that means they use the art to create their propaganda against us as a Palestinian. And that's why I've decided, okay, I cannot quit doing something about Palestine. I will go back doing my art about Palestine. And that's why my, my, uh, my uh, uh, graduation or my dissertation was this, uh, this art, my first comics book about the Palestinian prisoner and the Palestinian people in Palestine. And that's why I have done this, this art to resist, not just against the Israeli occupation, against their propaganda and against their narrative and against the pro-Israeli people and their narrative. And just I want to mention something that if you are hungry, you will not buy uh, flowers or flour. You will buy bread or rice to eat. And as a Palestinian, we don't, we don't have this luxury to, <laughs> to do something about something else. We have a lot of issues to talk about it. We will resist by our art because we are part from this resistant. And always I'm talking about the resistant by my art, not just um, I want to justify or to just to make an excuse that we should use all of this kind of art because we don't have the right to resist or to fight against the Israeli by the military uh, way or what they call it violence way. As a Palestinian people, as a people who they are live under the occupation, we have the right under the international law to fight against this occupation by any way, by weapons, by art, by narrative, by all of these tools. Um, I'm not just saying or talking about the art uh, as the only way to resist against the occupation. We have the right to resist by all of our ways, by BDS, boycotting Israel, by using what they call it violence, by using art. Yeah. Carlos, you draw things really all over the world. I mean, you draw, I watch, I, I see your stuff about Brazil, about Palestine, about Syria, about Turkey. I mean, you draw things about everywhere. You have a, a big audience. I mean, what do you think about when you draw these things? You're really an international uh, uh, artist. Well, every time um, I get uh, a feedback from someone, in some part of the world, like um, some protest people printed one of my cartoons and went to the streets or a t-shirt or a tattoo. I already saw many people tattooing cartoons <laughs> on their skin. Um, I, I think uh, not only this, but also uh, young people making cartoons, political cartoons inspired by the cartoons I made. This is something very, this is a, a big responsibility because we are uh, 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 forming other ca future cartoonists, inspiring uh, other future cartoonists who uh, gonna keep our uh, uh, duchy, you know, uh, exposing not only the Israeli apartheid, but uh, also other um, human rights abuses around the world, because the world is plenty of human rights abuses. So uh, I, I feel myself very glad to know uh, I'm inspiring people to not only to print or tattooing or something, but also uh, following the same path, you know, as political cartoonists. This is very important. And um, uh, of course, uh, I do, I make these cartoons because uh, I feel the need to expose uh, these uh, uh, human rights abuses, as I said, and because as I used to say, I am a, a, a visual uh, uh, describer, uh, narrator of the barbarism. So the political cartoonist is, is played this role, you know, 
to expose the barbarism. And um, I also, uh, I think the, the role of a political cartoonist is to expose local and international uh, 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 abuses. Two things are, are very important in my career. Two topics are very close to, close to my heart because I saw to myself. Of course, I made many cartoons. For example, I have a great audience in Egypt because I supported, supported the Arab Spring in Egypt from, from the day one until the end. Uh, I, I, I made many cartoons. I have a big audience in Turkey because my cartoons are about Erdogan. Lot, yeah. But uh, two topics touch me personal, in a personal level. The police brutality in Brazil and the Palestinian topic. Because these two things I saw to myself I spent a time in Palestine and I saw to myself how Palestinians live. Of course, nothing can be compared to, for example, Mohammed's experience because he is Palestinian and he is in the eye of the storm. He's living the occupation. I'm talking about the occupation. I'm drawing about the occupation, but he's living the occupation. Yeah. So it's completely different. Um, I'm 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 uh, I'm very modest in this in this aspect. I only draw about the Palestinian suffering and resistance. I used to say I don't see my I I can see myself as an activist because Mohammed is an activist. For example, I'm just a friend of Palestinians, and after seeing what I saw in Palestine, the way the Palestinians live under occupation, it's impossible for me not to be not to have solidarity for Palestinians. And about police brutality, I born and raised in Rio de Janeiro. I saw to myself how pol uh, police brutality affect people, especially black people and the poor communities. I saw many people shot down, you know, many police, uh, mili infantry-like police uh, operations and favelas. So these two topics touch me personally. And every time I see someone using of one of my cartoons about police brutality or Palestinian topic, or even starting making cartoons inspired by the cartoons I made, I feel myself great, uh, grateful. I'm sure everybody else is grateful that you've drawn those cartoons. Well, I think it's time to open up for a few questions. We've actually gone way beyond our time. This conversation is really wonderful. Um, Jamil, do you want to come back in and pick a few questions? Yeah, yeah, sure thing. We have, we have a bunch quick. of- We don't have a lot of time, maybe just two or three. Okay. Um, well, the, the, a bunch of people were asking, um, what was the name of the cartoonist and photographer that I think each of you had mentioned and, and where we can find his work? I think his name was Muhammad Afifa. Uh, Muhammad Afifa. Yeah. I've sent his profile to the uh, chat uh, yeah. for all the people. Yeah, to, they can see his uh, his profile. Is he is he currently active or, or not? Is it hard to find his stuff? His, his name... Uh, yeah, he is. Yeah, his his profile is in, uh, is active. His name is Muhammad Abu Afifa, okay. and I've sent his. Yeah, I've just sent his his profile again for all the Perfect. people. Okay, we had a lot of questions about that, so I wanted to clear that up. Um, this is a question uh, from uh, yeah. Fadi for Sara. Uh, Sara, how does the Bahraini government see your work? I guess you should ask the Bahraini government. <laughs> <laughs> They haven't let you know then. No. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll move it's on a to... tricky question. <laughs> 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 One can presume that you know, perhaps they're not fans. Um, this question is from uh, Rabbi Lynn Gottlieb. The, the, the question is, there are many amazing murals in Palestine where people express th themselves. I'm thinking of the Women's Center in Nablus in, in Balada as an example that has the history of Palestine in four beautiful panels. Muhammad, can you comment on how much uh, mural work impacts your vision? It was an honor to meet you when I brought an artist delegation of color to work 
with young people making mural art in Palestine? Actually, I've never done any mural in, in Palestine. Uh, I've done something about some, some people who were killed by the Israeli soldier as a portrait for these people, but I have never done any, any murals for about Palestine. Uh, but I, I think about that. Maybe we should do some murals and uh, some artwork uh, in the street for, for the people. Uh, but actually, I, I, the, the most important thing that we should express our issues for the people around the world, not just in Palestine. We are not talking with ourselves about, about our issues. We should convey our issues here in Palestine for the people around the world to understand the situation here in Palestine. And that's what, why exactly I'm doing all of my activity outside Palestine. That's why I've printed my first book in Palestine. That's how I'm, I'm trying to do my second book outside Palestine to, to raise awareness about the Palestinian issues for the people around the world. Uh, I do agree that maybe, we, yeah, yeah, we can do artwork here in Palestine. And, but I'm, I'm not sure that's very useful for the Palestinian issues. The useful for the Palestinian issues to do some artwork outside Palestine. That's why I do respect Karo Slatuf's work because he's not Palestinian, he's not Arab guy, and he's doing this artwork about the, the Palestine. That's why I, I like Sarah's work because she's doing uh, all of these cartoons about Palestine. And that's why we think we should like just spread, uh, spread our our artwork around the world to talk about the Palestinian issues, to uh, provoke the people, to encourage the people to, to to support the Palestinian issues, and that's why also I'm I'm trying to do some some another artwork like T-shirt like Sarah. I'm trying to uh, Nicole uh, have one <laughs> have one of my T-shirts from some uh, some websites outside Palestine. And that's why the, exactly I think we should spread the Palestinian issues around the world. Unfortunately, now we should work also in the Arab world because of the normalization. We should work in some of the Arab countries because they want, they, unfortunately, this, this country who they now have, have this relation with Israel, they know that they have the mainstream media in the Arab world and they, try to block the Palestinian narrative for the Arab people in, uh, nowadays. And that's why in my second book, I will try to translate it for the Arab, Arab language, for, for the Arab audience to raise awareness about the Palestinian issues. Uh, it's good to, to do mural uh, for the Palestinian people just to raise the kids, to, to, to show the kids the art and to raise them as an artist because we don't have a good, uh, art facility, art uh, exhibitions, galleries here in Palestine. And it's good to do this art in the street for the people, but it's not useful for the Palestinian issues. Okay. Uh, the, there's another question here. This one is from Barbara. The question is, can each of you share some important Palestinian artistic influences outside of Neji al -Ali? I have many uh, influences, Palestinian artists. Uh, there's uh, someone called Amjad Rasmi in Jordan. He's Palestinian and he's a great cartoonist. Um, Mohamed Bouafifi, who, who, who mentioned, uh, there are many Palestinian artists that we can uh, share with all of you, but uh, I don't have, I have to search now about maybe Amjad Rasmi, if I can share, um, share yeah. I will I will send his profile for uh, by chat maybe it's it's more useful. For me, I remember Mona Hatoum. Oh, what's the what's the name? Uh, Mona Hatoum. Hatoum. Yeah, sh she's not a cartoonist. She's uh, she's an artist. Great one. You know, the question was just. Uh, not specific cartoons, just Palestinian artists like mm. uh, that have influenced your work in any kind of way. Yeah, everyone uh, knows, everyone it was knows, everyone knows Najee Ali, you know, or most people. Mm. Yeah, Mona Hatoum is is great. Her work is so powerful. How is it? Let me ask you. How is it, Najee, that particularly Najee Ali and his work became so? You know, exploded all over the world and and became so well known. Why do you think Anzala? 
and Najil Ali's work became so you know iconic to you know all over the world. How do you explain that? What do you think? Um, I'm asking all three of you. Maybe Sara, you want to start? What do you think? Yeah, I guess uh, the work itself it was so powerful, and it's so difficult to work um, this much and still uh, deliver quality and quantity. I was listening at, in, at one of uh, his interviews. His wife uh, mentioned that um, he sometimes produced three to five um, artworks in one day. Do you realize how difficult is this? How stressing is this? Um, it has to do also with, with his story. It was it's terrible. Can you believe that someone end your life just because yeah, you draw? The cartoons, yeah. yeah. And also the use of, of, of people for his character, Hamdallah, just everywhere. What do you think, Muhammad? Why do you think he has such an influence? He's so... I think because at his time, we, we didn't have a lot of representative for the Palestinian people around the world who they use the art as a tool to re to represent the Palestinian people and his story because he he was killed because of his artwork and he he faced not just the Israeli uh, regime he faced the Palestinian uh, the Palestinian political fictions the Arab regimes and the, the occupation um, that's another another reason and that the last one because he he was killed because of his artwork. And I mean, a lot of his work was against the Arab regimes and really a lot of his work includes a lot of text as well. There's a lot of text in his work. So if you don't speak Arabic, you don't, there's no way, if you can't read it, you don't know what that, what that, what you're looking at. But a lot of it is specifically against the Arab, big, fat, ugly, you know. Yeah. Um, Muhammad, you do that sometimes too. You show the Arab regimes as the Arab leaders. As the yeah, sometimes I use that, but I think Najir Ali, because at his time, we don't have a lot of cartoonists who use that. He established the Palestinian, uh, I, I think he established the Arab cartooning uh, art, not just the Palestinian and the cartooning art. And that's why I think he, he he's very important. Two years ago, I was in, 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 in Manhattan and one of my friends, Seth Tobukman, he used to teach about uh, Naji Al Ali for the School of Visual Art in Manhattan. Uh, a lot of uh, schools around the world, art schools around the world, they teach about Naji Al Ali uh, as a one of the first cartoons who were killed be because of their cartoons. And uh, the stereotype about the, about the Arab world that they don't have art, they don't have all this kind of uh, art or uh, cartooning, or all of this kind of thing. And when when they teach that in 1948 in, in Palestine, someone who, who were uh, expelled from Palestine as refugees in refugees camp in Lebanon, and then he became a cartooning cartoonist who, who's, who started his career in refugees camp. It is very uh, interesting story about uh, an artist who established him himself without any teaching, without any, without any resources, actually. Yeah. Carlos, when did you become aware of Najil Ali? When, when did you, uh, I'm sure you, you know, you've seen him, you've seen his work. You're mute. I don't recall exactly when I uh, had the first contact with uh, Naji Al Ali work. Probably it was in one of those trips to Middle East. Uh, because when I go to, when I went to Middle East, it, it was very uh, common. People come, coming and saying, Latouf, have you heard about Naji Al Ali? Ah. He's a Palestinian cartoonist, etc. He's a, a legend, yeah. and uh, maybe uh, due his uh, death, he <clears throat> become a, a legend, you know, a myth, and uh, because he died for what he believed, and he died because he draw cartoons. It's, uh, you yeah. know, uh, it's, it's very interesting because um, we celebrate the memory of the cartoonists of the Charlie Hebdo, Charlie Hebdo and French. 
they were killed for making cartoons, but they made cartoons uh, to mock and offend the Muslims. And the Western mainstream media, <clears throat> the Western establishment uh, was very fond of Charlie Hebdo exactly because they have uh, anti-immigrant and anti-Islam uh, 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 agenda. Uh, I remember, for example, uh, uh, Angela Merkel presenting, uh, awarding uh, one of the cartoonists who, who participate of the Mohammed uh, contest, the Prophet Mohammed contest as a representation of the freedom of speech. So today, when you think about someone who drawn, who, who was killed by something who drawn, something they believed, you say Charlie Hebdo. But in a matter of fact, uh, Najee Al-Ali is more important to me because he died exposing uh, the brutality of Israeli occupation and the complicity and corruption of the Arabic countries. And um, I used to say I had three uh, influences in my work as a political cartoonist. Um, Louis Hamaker, uh, who was a um, uh, Dutch, I think, no, 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 Dutch, he's uh, from Belgian, I think, Belgian cartoonist uh, in, the, in the times of World War I. He made many cartoons against the Germans. His style is very unique, very, you know, shocking. Uh, I, I, I love his style, very classic. Joe Sacco, uh, he's a comics writer. Uh, who made cart uh, albums, comic albums about Gaza, about Palestine, etc. And Naji Al Ali uh, also. And uh, responding, one of the of the the, the participants uh, asking about uh, the Palestinian cartoonist. Now uh, I like the work of uh, Imad Hajaj. I, I love his style. I love his cartoons. He's very, you know, very clever on delivering a political message. He's very cleaving and clever. And sometimes you don't need to read back to understand. You can understand that cartoon in any part of the world. I love this. Well, folks, it's um, we're out of time. Actually, we've gone way beyond the time. This has been a fantastic conversation. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed seeing the three of you and talking to you. Um, Hamad and Sarah and Carlos, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Let's stay in touch. Let's talk again soon. Like Carlos said, hopefully, inshallah, we will all meet in Palestine. I think it will be the best place to meet. And continue. Starbucks. <laughs> in start in start and box. <laughs> <laughs> Stars and boxes in Ramallah. And thank you to the audience and everybody who asked questions. And, and thank you, Jamil, for uh, doing all the work behind the scenes. And um, inshallah, we'll see you again soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Nico, thank, Bye -bye. thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I so, I'm so glad to have you, to, 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 to be among you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Jamil. Thank you, Mohammed. And thank you to all the audience. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye bye, everybody. Thank bye bye. You. Bye bye.